we could pray just once more and ask the Lord to be with us as my dear Father in heaven. We just want to give this sermon to you. We just ask that your spirit may be here and bless us, come into us, come into the reading of your word, that there may be power and that it may move a heart here this morning that unity is important, team spirit that we can work together and look forward to your soon coming in Jesus' name. Amen. Kingdom of heaven may may be compared to this. Dear Richard, don't invite me to your birthday party because I'm not coming. And give back the Disneyland sweatshirt I said you could wear. If I'm not good enough to play on your team, I'm not good enough to be friends with your former friend, Janet. P.S. I hope that when you go to the dentist, he finds 20 cavities. (laughs) Dear Janet. Here's your stupid Disneyland sweatshirt. I want my comic books now, whether you're finished with them or not. No girl has ever been on the Map Street baseball team, and as long as I'm captain, no girl ever will. Richard. Dear Richard, I'm changing my goldfish's name from Richard to Stanley, and don't count on my vote for class president this year. Just because I'm a member of the ballet club doesn't mean I'm not a terrific ball player, Janet. P.S. I see you lost your first game, 28-0. to zero. <laughs> Dear Janet, Why don't you forget about baseball and learn something nice like knitting, Janet? Dear Richard, my father said I could call someone to go with us for a ride in hot fudge Sundays. In case you didn't notice, I didn't call you, Janet. P.S. I see you lost your second game, 34 to 0. <laughs> Dear Richard, congratulations on your unbroken record. Eight straight losses. Wow. I understand you're the laughing stock of New Jersey. Why don't you and your team forget about baseball and learn something nice like knitting? <laughs> Dear Janet, I didn't think you'd be the kind who'd kick a man when he's down, Richard. Dear Richard, I wasn't kicking exactly. I was kicking back. In case you're wondering, my batting average is .345, Janet. Dear Janet, Elfie is having his tonsils out tomorrow. We might be able to let you catch next week. Richard, dear Richard, I pitch. Janet, dear Janet, Joel is moving to Kansas and Danny sprained his wrist. How about a permanent place in the outfield, Richard? Dear Richard, I pitch. Janet, dear Janet, Ronnie caught the chicken box and Leo broke his toe. And Elwood has these stupid violin lessons. I'll give you a first base and that's my final offer, Richard. Dear Richard, Susan Riley plays first base and Marilyn Jackson catches. Ethel Kahn plays center field, and I... (laughs) Good. 
It's a package deal, Jenin. Sorry about your 12-game losing streak. <laughs> Dear Jenin, please, not Marilyn Jackson, Richard. Dear Richard, nobody said I was unreasonable. How about Lizzie Martindale instead? Dear Janet, could you call your goldfish Richard again? Your friend, Richard. In this parable, who is Richard? In the parable that talks about the kingdom of heaven, who is Richard? And it is you and I. You and I are Richard on this baseball team. And we all have our own baseball team. Now, in this parable again, who would Janet be? Who wants to pitch in your life? Jesus does. Okay, so we have Richard and Janet. However, something keeps happening here. And we notice that, like, Dear Richard, my father said I could call someone to go with us for ride in Hudford Sundays. In case you didn't notice, I didn't call you. I, you lost your second game 34 0. Dear Richard, congratulations on your unbroken record. So who keeps reminding us that we need Jesus on our team? Who is that? Holy Spirit, thank you. That's exactly right. So the Holy Spirit's job in John 16, 8 is to convince and convict us of our sin and of our need to have Jesus in our lives. And we have one more thing that's going on in here just to examine this parable a little closer. We have Janet who wants to be in our team. Does she want to catch? Does she want to play the outfield? What does she want to do? She will only pitch. She wants to pitch. And I'd like to have you turn in 2 Corinthians 5.14. 2 Corinthians 5.14. Because we know that not only does Jesus want to play on our team, but he wants to be the pitcher, and that's what it says in Second Corinthians 5.14. Now, someone joked with me, saying, Oh, are you going to be talking about Genesis 1, 1 today? And what does that have to do with baseball? You tell me. What does Genesis 1, 1 have to do with baseball? The there you go. <laughs> In the big inning. Uh, no, we're not going to be talking about that this morning. But we are going to talk about team spirit. And 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For Christ's love constrains us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him we living for Jesus, who died for us and was raised again. So the love of Christ, in the King James Version says, it constrains us or holds us back. Keeps us from doing those things that we shouldn't do. That sounds logical, doesn't it? In many other translations, you'll see the word that Christ's love does what? What does your translation say? Compels us. Thank you. Now, compels is a good word. Instead of holding us back, the love of Christ is now driving us forward, pushing us forward to serve God and to do His will. Both good, right? So we have it um, constraining us, compelling us, 
There's another translation. Now, this word is very interesting. And that, um, this word can mean, and it's synaxo in Greek. And what's interesting is this tree, this word also means it constrains us. It pushes us forward, but it also controls us. So that it does both. The love of Christ controls us. And that's an important thing to know, that it does both in our lives. So Jesus wants to do what on your baseball team? He wants you to be one to pitch, that's correct. And so what do we have to do to get Jesus on our team? Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door, and what? And if anyone wishes Jesus to come in, what do they have to do? Open the door. Ask him to come in. It's that simple. This team spirit that we're talking about, many things need to have team spirit. One of which is a sailboat. And so when you're using a sailboat, it's quite difficult to do it by yourself. Did you know that? And why is that? Because on a sailboat, there's all these lines, and there's all these sails to work. And so team spirit is important in sailing. If you have a person running the tiller, it's hard to have do everything all by yourself. Um, sailing, just a couple other things. What about if you're in a band? And so I play the string bass. Can we have a band with just the string bass all by itself? It gets quite boring. <laughs> like they say, you want to get a person to talk. Just to have a string bait solo, and then uh, that's when people all start talking during the middle of your solo. It gets boring. I know. So that's a string bait. But it takes unity in a band. It takes unity to play baseball. You can't play a game of baseball all by yourself. I think it's impossible. It's not impossible to say it by yourself. It's just harder. But you can't play baseball. You can't play basketball all by yourself. You, there are certain things you can't do by yourself. And it takes unity. It, it's also not possible to totally and completely run a church all by yourself. Did you know that? You can have a pastor and he can run it. But you've got to have teachers, you have to have people who take up the offering, you have to have people who, you know what I'm saying? It takes people to teach the young people's class. It takes many people to take responsibility to run a church. And thank you, by the way, we just finished nominating committee, and thank you for being willing to do that. This is the team spirit that we're talking about. This team spirit is important. Committee meetings. You have a balanced church when people work together in unity. Please turn with me to Ephesians 4.3. Ephesians 4.3. This was our scripture reading, and it says in Ephesians 4, 3, endeavoring, earnestly striving, make every effort. You understand? That's the first word. It can mean all of these things. It means it's not just watching it or sitting on the sidelines. It's literally putting forth effort, earnestly striving, make every effort to keep or to continue on keeping. Um, Paul here assumes it already exists. And then this word unity. Now this word unity is interesting that it literally means one. It means people working in a harmonious 
whole working together so that they become one working together. So earnestly striving to become, to, uh, um, to keep the unity of the spirit. And what spirit are we talking about here? It's the Holy Spirit who provides this unity, who works in us to be willing and able to work together toward this unity. Um, in the Spirit, in the bond, and this bond is interesting, and that it has to do with a rope, a tie, or the glue that holds something together. And it's the bond of peace. And if I could just suggest to you one more Greek word here, and it's this word of peace. Now, you know what peace is. But this word has even a a larger meaning. And this peace means harmoniously working together in fellowship. So, let's just read this whole verse backwards. Right? And it goes like this. This fellowship that is bonded together with this glue of that the Holy Spirit provides to create unity. So that means that this fellowship is important. And it is the glue which helps us to have Unity together. Let's go back to uh, uh, Ephesians 4 1. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient with one another. Love in, in love. And so here we have four essential things, four essential qualities for unity. Number one, the first quality is humbleness. And this humbleness is humility of mind. Being willing to work with each other. A humbleness that allows... um, um, Jesus described this when he said about the yoke, take my yoke upon you and learn of me in gentleness and in humbleness. So, uh, the command to live with all humbleness is a hard saying to the unconverted heart, for it runs counter to every natural impulse of the human spirit. This gentleness that it's talking about is being willing to accept hurt unto you by others and being willing to forgive them. This quality is essential to the unity of the church. Without it, division soon appears. Gentleness being the denial of self-assertion, even under provocation, cannot exist without a humbleness. Then we have patience. Under any and all circumstances, for all reasons, is the essence of patience. And that of bearing with one another or holding each other up. To be concerned for each other and to endure that relationship no matter what happens. I'd like to invite you all to come with us on a cable car ride today. And as in San Francisco, our family went on a cable car ride, and I always wanted to go on one. And so I thought we could invite the whole church. Just let's go on a cable car ride this morning. And so we're all getting on the cable car. 
We're all coming together to get on the cable car and everyone's jostling and bustling, trying to find places to sit. And while they're finding a place to sit, some people want to sit on the aisle, some want to sit by the window. Um, others are getting settled, talking to each other, uh, getting ready to go. And we're all just kind of sitting together. Finally, what happens is, is the conductor stands up, he blows his whistle, and he says, all aboard. Tickets, please. Did you bring your ticket? You have a ticket. Do you have a ticket? You sure do. We'll stamp your ticket for you. There it is. Tickets, please. Everybody has tickets. I'm glad you brought your tickets this morning. And we need you to have tickets to be able to be on this trip this cable car together. And so as the conductor goes around and gets all the tickets, people get settled. And they get settled in their seats. And the conductor is settled and they're all ready to go. Now, they've been there for quite a while and they look around out of the windows and, and they look and they say, I've seen that tree before. It's been there for a long time. It's always in the same place. Look out the window there. That's the restaurant we ate at this morning. And look over there. There's a yellow truck over there. The same one. So finally Jennifer stands up and says, she says, wait a minute. This, this, this cable car is not going. I was going to have Jennifer help me with this, too. She's helped me with a lot of sermons. And so Jennifer says, this cable car isn't going anywhere. And so we look around, and who knows how long we've been sitting there. It could have been for a long time. Finally, the conductor says, well, you have to be patient. These things take time. And so we're sitting there for a while longer. Finally, Mr. Jones over here says, but wait a minute. He says, when do we arrive at our destination? When do we finally get there? The conductor says, no one knows the day nor the hour. In fact, there's been many delays, but, but we will get there if we all stay together. And if we all work together, we'll get to our destination. And so we settle in, and we wait a bit longer. And finally, Mr. Bradley stands up and he says, but, but why don't we form a committee? And let's all get together and try to figure out why this cable car isn't going anywhere. And so they form a committee, and of course they asked Mr. Bradley to take it because he's the one who made the suggestion anyway. And finally they're talking together, and the first thing they talk about is, let's try to figure out why this cable car we're all sitting in, why isn't it going anywhere? And so the first thing they see is, I know the reason. Tickets, please. Have tickets. Have to have tickets to ride this cable car. Here's a ticket. I can get it here. What do you think? I'm too nervous. <laughs> tickets. Tickets. Tickets, everyone. So the first thing that's suggested is, wait a minute. I know why this cable car isn't going anywhere. Because the conductor keeps coming around and asking for money all the time. Well, no wonder we're not getting anywhere. And so with all they just keep asking for money, the cable car isn't moving. And so another one stood up, and this is Mr. Smith, and he says, No, what we need is not quantity. We're not trying to fill all these empty seats. We Quantity would help us get money so we could have more money to move along, right? So we want to fill all these empty seats that are here in our cable car. However, 
another person stood up and said, it, it's not quantity that we need, it's quality. So we should just have higher class people on this car. And if there was just higher class people, then people would look at the car and they'd want to come in and join us. And that would fill up the seats. And everybody wanted to vote on that. That's what we needed, better quality in our church. But guess what happened? It died because people didn't know if they were going to be the ones voted out because they weren't the higher class people. So that wasn't a good idea. And it died too. Finally, they decided, okay, what we need to do is decorate. We got to decorate this place. Now this green is okay, don't you think? And that tie looks nice too. That's that's quality, quality person right there, Mr. Bob. But you see that it's if we decorate this, and so the committee got together and they were talking together and saying that's what we need to do. But they started saying, okay, maybe this green and so good, or blue or whatever. Maybe we need red. And so as soon as they started talking about colors, there got to be an angry discussion, and this mic keeps falling off. (laughs) This discussion, and uh, then um, they talked about it, and everybody started arguing, and the whole committee died in angry death, (laughs) because that didn't work either. So... Finally, one person stood up, and and her name was Miss um, uh, Mr. Taylor. He stood up and he says, "I'm getting off this cable car. Nothing's going on on this cable car, and I think it's time that we just move on." Well, good. And finally, the the conductor stood up, and he says. No, we don't need tickets. I just need your attention, he says. He says, what we need to do is try to calm these other passengers down. Let's talk to them. And let's, in fact, let's invite some of our older members to get a testimony and tell it and just try to calm the passengers down so they can enjoy it. Finally, there was a person. This was Jennifer again. <laughs> And she starts looking around. There's got to be some reason why this cable car is not moving. Why would a cable car not be moving? There is no engine. A cable car is unique in that there's a groove down the middle of the road. Do you see that? Right under the grid on on the middle of the cable car. And there's a groove. So Jennifer said, look at that. There's a groove right down the middle of the road. And so she said, something has to happen here. And so she's looking around and finally she notices there's a handle there. This handle has to have something to do with it. So she began to study it and figure out what could be going on here. And so she tries to get the conductor's attention and Mr. Bradley's attention. Mr. Bradley, I discovered something. He couldn't hear because it was still in a committee meeting with the the conductor. And they they were still wondering if it was okay to wear blue jeans in church or not. So they didn't hear what was going on. And so finally, they, they, they got their attention. They said, I need your attention. There is a handle in the middle of the cable car, and this handle has to have something to do with it. So the conductor says, he comes over, they study it together, and they said, you know, we need, it's time to take time and pray. So they prayed about what they needed to do to start moving the cable car, and it had something to do with this handle. And so they prayed about it, and then Mr. Bradley says, what also needs to happen is we've got to study the man on this car. 
And so they start opening up their manuals to find out what it is that can get the cable car moving. Now you'll notice they had unity, but they were lacking something. And what do you think they were lacking? Yeah, a connection. A connection to that groove in the road which which had a cable in the middle of the road, in the road, a cable that moves all the time. And we saw this when we were at San Francisco. You could actually see this cable moving through the groove, and it just keeps moving. But what needs to happen, and they read their manuals, and they said, what we need to do is take that handle and move it forward. And as soon as they move that handle forward, what happened? It started moving. Because what what did they find out? It connected themselves to Christ. So unity is very important that we work together but that connection needs to be connected to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Read your manuals. And this cable car will be moving. Because we will connect it to the cable. Amen. Amen. And yes, in closing, <laughs> Just go back to Ephesians once more, and I'd like to just look at something very quickly with you. And these are the elements that give us team spirit or unity, and that's right here. Ephesians 4, and Ephesians 4, uh, 4. And so, let's read this together. There is one body. Now, what's one body mean? And take this off. It's actually kind of hot. <laughs> there is one body. And this one body means that Christians are not an independent entity. We are meant to be able to work together. We are meant to share together. Also, there's one. Oh, oh. Okay. Here we go. And then there's one spirit. All fruits, all qualities, all come from who? The Holy Spirit gives us those qualities. Notice that we have the spirit when we're connected to Jesus Christ, okay? We have to be connected. Then we can have unity in all of these elements, these talents that every one of us have all work together. Then we have one hope. All Christians are called to the same hope, the hope of the salvation and the second coming of the Lord. Then we have one Lord, it says. All Christians have the same Lord to whom they are subject those who give complete submission and allegiance to the same Lord will not find fault with one another. We have one faith. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope. When you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all. This one baptism, all are baptized by a water baptism, which symbolizes death and resurrection, cleansing and separation. We grow together in the likeness of Christ, in one God and Father of all. There is only one Father to us all. We are all sons and daughters of God. He is a Father who can be trusted and is a friend to everyone. Titus 2.13 says, Titus 
So we got first and second Timothy, Titus two, very small chapter after second Timothy. Titus two thirteen says looking forward, looking ahead for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so let us let us look forward to the hope of our Lord's soon return. And with unity and purpose and team spirit, we will be looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ.